Welcome back, Rebels. Welcome back. This is another one of those podcasts in our Adobe series. Yeah, this is one of the episodes we've done in partnership with Adobe. Um, it's just awesome that they supported us on this little series. Yes, and we've got another great guest uh, coming up this week. But first, I wanted to talk about uh, something that's been bothering me. What's been bothering you, David Speed? Uh, all the people, Adam. All the people. The people are bothering me. Um, it, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. So a lot of you guys listening, you send us wins and our Instagram DM inbox is like constantly a stream of people like asking advice on what they should do or or telling us about kind of stuff that yeah. they have done and like, am I making the right decision or all of that sort of stuff, which I absolutely love. But when you look at the thousands of people that listen to our podcast each week, I know that not all of them are taking action. And so a lot of you guys are in jobs and you're doing something on the side or whatever, or you just like listening to creative people, that's absolutely fine. And a lot of you are taking the stuff that we're talking about, you're listening to other podcasts, you're getting this wide kind of education online and you're putting it into action. And from that, amazing things are happening. But there is also a subsect, and I fear that it's it's probably a majority of people who are listening, getting fired up and then not taking action. This podcast has been going now for like over a year and a half. So if you started listening at the beginning, like I I want you to have achieved something by now. And if you haven't, then it's like, let's look at what it is that's, that's stopping that action from taking place. Is it like, is it that the right idea hasn't come through yet? Is it that you, you're not actually truly passionate about the thing that you want to do? Like, what is it that's holding people back? Because they they love the show and they listen, but then they're not actually fulfilling these things. They're not doing these things. Yeah, I think it is so important to turn motivation into action because it is so easy to get motivated in something and then not do anything because you get that little like, oh, that's great. I'll do that later. Even listening at a good time that is going to cause you to cause action straight after like if you know you're going to listen to this before bed for example and then you're going to go to sleep so you can't put any action in maybe don't listen to it then if you're going to listen to it just before you're about to go into a meeting or just before you're about to do something else maybe that's not the best time I think motivation can be used in a really powerful way if you time it rightly into whatever you're doing so for example if you know like this is what I do in the mornings quite often I'll get up early I'll read something, listen to something that is inspirational, that will motivate me, whether that's a blog post from an author that I like or just like an interesting book that I've been reading recently. And then I'll consume that for a certain amount of time when I know I've got some time before I start work for the day. I'll turn whatever I've just learned there, the motivation I've got from that, the knowledge that I've learned into action. I heard something really great recently by Chris Doe from The Future. He's got a little like theory that he likes to do is says, for every piece of content you consume, make two pieces. And I really like wow. I really like that idea of just it it really makes you think about what you consume because it then it, make, it stops you consuming content that you know is going to be a waste of time or know it isn't going to create something going forward from there. It's not going to give you any inspiration, it's not going to give you any motivation. So it makes you actually be precious about what you spend your time on, what you spend your time consuming. And then if you know you have to turn that into two pieces, even if that's just because two pieces of content sounds huge. If you're an artist and you're an oil painter, yes, two pieces of content could take you a year to create those two canvases, but it doesn't have to be those huge things. It could be a tweet on Twitter, like one little thing you got from there, and then a co- even a comment on someone else's thing on Instagram. Like just creating two things inspired off what you've just consumed. I think doing that is a really great way to turn that motivation into action. Yeah, I, I think the thing that you do as well, and I should probably do it too, but I don't. I think the thing that you do is really good in that whenever you listen to a book or listen to a podcast, you're always taking notes. Yeah. Um, which means that it's it's not just going to like wash over your brain and then and then disappear. Um, and it gives you that if, if you don't have the motivation, everything's locked away in this notebook. So as soon as you do feel inspired, you can just pick up, go through those pages, find something in there that sparks an action yeah. or, or sparks an idea. That's Yeah, that's such a good point because when I'm, if I am taking notes, so quite often if I'm listening on the train or I'm like going somewhere and I've always got a notepad with me. So if I'm listening to something, I'm like, okay, I'm going to write this down. Quite often what I'll do is I'll use the left and right page of my notepad quite strategically. So my right page will be the taking notes and interesting things that have happened there. And I'll use the left page for 
actually creating my own ideas. So sometimes I'll pause what I'm listening to based on what's just been said, then go to the left page and start writing my own thoughts and ideas about the thing that's on the right page. If I don't have the time to action it straight away, then that's when, when I've got motivation and I know I've got some time, I'll go through that book, look at what I've started to write on the left page and then fully fill that out into like a blog post or something that I want to create going forward or just even form an idea. Making the most of turning that motivation into action, whether that's now or giving yourself the best opportunity to do that later. So yeah, look, we, we understand it's hard. Like everything is hard. Life is hard. It's 2020. I, I mean, it's ridiculous. Everything is crashing around around us. But I think that if you want to change something, you have to take action. It's like when we had Chase Jarvis on the show and he said that you can't think your way out of a problem. And thinking and planning is is absolutely crucial so that you don't just go Bleh, and just do whatever. But you can't just get stuck in that in that thinking forever. And there will never be a right time. It's like having kids, like making making something, doing something. There's never going to be a right time for you. You've just got to jump in. You've got to jump in with both feet, not one toe. And I want that for people because on the other side of it is is happiness and fulfillment. And that's what we want. Yeah, I think the planning aspect of what you said there is a really good point. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier. If the only piece of action you can make is to block a certain piece of time in your calendar in the future to go and put that action in, then that's great too. At least you've made some form of action that also gives you the time in the future to create something or do something. So yeah, I'm not going to be that guy that goes like, Elon Musk has the same 24 hours that that you do. <laughs> like you do have time. And in if currently your time is completely blocked out, you're going to have to sacrifice something. And whether that's like time with your with your significant other and you're going to have to have this conversation of like at the moment this is really important to me and so we're going to have to watch one less series a week and I'm going to have to spend this time doing this whether it's um going out with your friends and seeing your mates which is like it's super important but like I I I can't do this for the next 6 months like yeah. I'm because I'm focusing on this whatever it is where fight like audit your week and look at look at where you can where you can lose that time and I mean <laughs> that there will be somewhere where you've got time to to be working on this thing and if you've only got an hour a week the results are going to take much longer to come the more time that you can put into something the quicker the rewards will come if you don't nurture something it will die so so where where you put your energies that is what's going to grow so work out where you where your energy is being wasted currently and bring that energy to where it where it can grow for you and it can flourish absolutely and i just want to know do you know where the word passion comes from i do not know where the word passion comes from are you going to tell me it actually comes from the latin which means to sacrifice ah i think i did know that it's in grit by angela duckworth which i've started to flick through now um but i found <laughs> that <laughs> but i found that super interesting the fact that you that it is a sacrifice. There are going to be elements of the rest of your life that you're going to have to sacrifice, whether that's time or money or something, to follow that passion. Because it's a balancing act of you're going to have to sacrifice one to get another because it's like the laws of equivalent exchange. Yeah, definitely. And and I think another thing that, that affects people and, and like specifically young people is the catch-22 of wanting opportunities, but not having the 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 back backlog of experience that's going to allow those opportunities to happen. And one thing that Yomi did was like before applying for jobs, like she just started her own thing, which gave her something in job interviews and, and finding opportunities of, uh, of like, I've already done this thing off of my own back on my own with no support. And, and like, yeah, and that shows a potential employer that this, this person has the, the skills that I need because you basically you're demonstrating. And if you just go with, I think the days of just going with like, yeah, I've got an English degree and I, I've got a so-and-so like, I think those days are, whilst those qualifications in certain positions are important, for the most part, like for us when we're employing, it's like we don't really care what letters you've got next to your name. It's like show us something tangible. It's like I've created this and it's like, yeah. oh, okay, that's that's what I need to see. And the most important things are confidence and self-belief. And if you can get those in a person, you're going to get so much more out of them than just having a degree, having something on paper. And you get the confidence and self-belief by going and doing something yourself. 
if you're going into a situation you've got no experience in it you're not going to have that belief you're not going to have that confidence so i think it's only by going and starting something only by going and doing something before you're ready when you're when there's no when you don't have any experience that's where that comes from so hopefully us uh Getting a bit cross with those of you that are not taking action. Um, hopefully that's lit a fire under you because, yeah, we we really do want the best for you. So this week's guest is the wonderful and amazing Yomi Adedike. Yeah, this was such a great episode. And despite the fact that she's from Croydon and for the first half an hour before we even started recording, you two were just chatting about Croydon and living that. Despite the fact. <laughs> yeah, so so full disclosure, because I know there's a lot of Croydon fans listening, but um, unfortunately you guys are outnumbered by the non-Croydon people. Um, so we did edit out about 20 minutes of Croydon chat at the beginning of this episode because me and Yomi got carried away. Um, but... Um, but yeah, it, w- it was amazing. And I think, I, I mean, I say it in the episode um, several times, but her book is so important, Slay yeah. in Your Lane. It's, it's a must read for anyone of any gender and any race. And I think for, for us as um, two white males that are obviously very, very aware of our privilege, um, it's, it's very important to, to be educated and to, to talk to as many diverse voices as possible and to, and to read this stuff because... Uh, because there, there's, I mean, just having uh, an African surname, for example, yeah. is going to decrease chances on on, your, on a CV. And it's it's knowing things like that, that that allow us to, until we know we can't make change, like within the creative industries and then within society yeah. as a whole. Um, and so so it's important, man. This, this is all important stuff. So let's get into this week's episode. Yomi Adegake is a journalist and author. Yomi writes about culture, class, politics and race. She co-wrote Slay in Your Lane, which deals with the complexities of getting ahead as a black woman in society. Yomi writes about issues that very few journalists covers, but are relevant to a huge audience, and herein lies her success. In this episode, we talk about being young, being black, and being authentic. So tell me about the the birth and the formation of Birthday Magazine. How did that come around? Oh, what a throwback. Okay, you've done your research, because that's kind of like, (laughs) that's kind of a buried one. Um... God, birthday came about in 2012 because, um, God, I was at university, I was at Warwick. Um, Warwick's actually another place where people are like, whoa, you're from Warwick too? Because it's just like its own strange other really posh Croydon where like it's just super insular and like everybody like knows each other but yeah like I was at Warwick studying law. I swear my life that I went there and was like, you know, I'm coming to Warwick to study law because I love to argue and it'd be great to professionalise it. That was literally the thought process. Like my parents, I think the, the kind of stereotype was, oh, my parents are like, you know, typical Nigerian parents are like, you know, you've got to be a lawyer, you've got to be a doctor, you've got to be an engineer. But my parents wanted me to be an architect because they've always been really supportive of my art and were kind of like, because I paint a lot. And they were kind of like, oh, if you can do it in a way that actually makes money, uh, they link between architecture and art that's not there. So I was like, oh, actually, no, um, I'd rather do law because, you know, I think, you know, it, it'd be something, I assumed it was something I'd be good at. I was horrendous. I couldn't do anything with it. I just was really bad, hated the Latin. It freaked me out. And then, um, God, I started suffering from like, I guess, yeah, mild, I'd say, depression in my third year. Like, it was just a real culture shock at Warwick, completely different. There were actually surprisingly an, a, a quite big amount of people from Croydon there, and that still wasn't enough to kind of make me feel at home. Um, so I had, like, yeah, I had, like, depression, and I left university in my final, I think my the end of my second year. Um, I took a year out, um, and literally had nothing to do and was just kind of like god like i feel like i'm like everyone else was getting work experience and um at this point i think maybe just a few months before i'd started a blog where i just used to like rant about things that um i thought you know were interesting or not and just like talk about loads of random things and um a friend of mine sort of said like you know, if you're going to take your year out, maybe you should try to like create something because like this blog that I was doing, it wasn't really, when I was trying to get work experience, people weren't sort of seeing it as valid work experience because it was obviously just my own like unprofessional blog. So she was like, maybe you should make something a little bit more, you know, like professional and something a little bit more like that has a bit more work to it that can kind of show that you have the skills of editing of like producing content and stuff like that. So then that's literally how birthday came about. Like, literally my friend was like yeah do something a bit more like with a bit more meat to it and I was like okay I could do a magazine and at that point there were literally like no magazines aimed at like young black women and like teenagers 
So um, I applied for a grant of like 500 pounds from Vinspired and another grant from OT Think Big. I don't even know if they exist anymore um, for like 300 pounds. And they gave me the funds to create um, Birthday. And that, that was literally how it, that's pretty much how it um, started. And that was God, like eight years ago. And so would you say, like, have you had a chance to kind of reflect on why you were feeling depressed during mm. that time? Do you think it was because you were maybe studying something that it, it or, or like you've been told by your parents and there was that pressure there of this is what I'm going to do and you were maybe feeling that it wasn't right for you and perhaps birthday was kind of your creative output that was kind of pulling you out of that depression. Yeah, I feel like... Um... You know, I mean, in terms of what I was studying, that was I have to I have to take responsibility for that because that was definitely my fault. Because <laughs> my parents were so like they were kind of just like, "Do you? Oh, we'd love you to be an architect." And I was like, "Nah, I, I don't like maths," and I don't think they realised how much my architect <laughs> architecture had in it. Because I feel they just thought I was just drawing pictures of houses, right? And I was like, "No, <laughs> it's actually like proper equations and shit." So it doesn't like fall down on, like the house I made. But so they were like, I'm the one who kind of was like. They thought I'd be good at law, but honestly, if I'd have been like, I'm studying English literature, they'd have totally just been like, that's fine. But I was just like, oh, right? cool. I was just like, oh, I want, I like, I don't know. I think growing up in a particular way, like, um, you know, I'm like, as a fellow Croydon native, you'll know, like, there's all these, there's like, Croydon's an amazing place, but like, you know, like, how do I put it? I guess it often can be a place where like, limit it can feel like there are certain limitations i suppose like there's a real stereotype that like you know follows like if you're from queen it's very much oh so you're like this and you're like that and i think honestly i had really big dreams and i was really kind of like um aspiring bougie and i was like oh i really want like you know a nice house and nice things so i was like i don't want to be like struggling because i'm following my dreams that was genuinely quite a self-imposed thing where i was like oh, i really do want I want the best of both worlds. I want to be able to do something I love, but I also want to be able to like, you know, be financially stable. And I think um, a lot of, you know, second generation immigrants have that like mentality of like, I need that financial security, but often it comes from our parents, right? But for me, it really came more from me because I was like, yeah, I can't be, I can't do this again. I can't do this thing of like, everyone's got like kickers and like a night bag. And I'm like, oh, I can't afford to buy one. And then I'm kind of like, like I, I was like I've done that as a child I don't want to do that <laughs> repeat that as an adult I don't know what the adult equivalent of like kickers are like lubes or something but I was just like I need to make sure that I'm like financially secure so I was like okay I'm gonna like go and do law and then obviously I hated it which you know it was my choice but I really really didn't like it and there was just so much like it, I think studying a subject that not only was like did I hate but I was not very good at um I think I wasn't really used to not being good at stuff, like except things I knew I was really bad at, like maths and like science, basically anything right. without words. But law, I felt like I'm just gonna be rank, writing like flouncy legal arguments and like wearing like, you know, a little cute two piece suit and you know what I mean, getting my Ali McBeal on. So when it wasn't like that, I was like, it's kind of like today when I was putting together the equipment, I was like, wow, I'm really bad at this. Like, wow, this is a surprise. Like, <laughs> cause I kind of assumed it forward. So with like um, law, I I guess I I assumed I'd be good at it at it because of like what I studied at um, college, which was like politics and English literature and word stuff. So um, I'm not very good at technical things, as we as we know. Um, so I wasn't. I was kind of like taken aback by how technical law was, which was a real shock. But then also work was a culture shock as well because I really was like one of like maybe 20 black people like in the at least definitely within my year maybe within like two years and like um you know it it really was like it was just a massive culture shock I really really was like doubly homesick for like my actual family and friends but also just like you know a particular kind of culture that I was used to and like there were literally swans on campus like it was so strange to have yeah. but pigeons I was like this is insane I don't know where <laughs> I don't know where I am so I think that played a part in as well um so yeah I think there are lots of different things I can totally relate that so obviously yeah. grew up in South London um but then when I went to uni I went to uh, Lancaster and it's such a different experience when you've come from where I come from and and like all of a sudden I'm like I, I used to say like I, I know I'm back in London because I get off the train and I can see yeah. other cultures because there's no no one else represented in Lancaster but like for me I always used to step off the the train coming back into London and realize that I'm 
that mm-hmm. I'm home again because I, like there's something very very like kind of restricting when you're when you're in in a space where there's there's just the 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 overwhelming voice is just yeah. the same it's, it becomes very Absolutely, kind of bland yeah. could not agree more like honestly especially that analogy of stepping off the train like literally you just get off trip over a Morley's box and you're like oh I'm back <laughs> <laughs> it's totally different man. and like yeah like i just like 100 percent. i think the thing with warwick is that like as i said because of Croydon excellence like there really was a strange like it was strange that the majority of the black kids genuinely were from Croydon. i was not the only um black like no, i wasn't even the only black nigerian person from Croydon, which is like such a specific experience but like just out aside from that like cluster like we genuinely had a theory that like they kind of had like catchment areas um God, I hope like, <laughs> I don't get sued by work for saying this, but like we used a theory where they were like, you know, they had like a catchment area per year because it was like sometimes the majority of kids would come from like Croydon, sometimes the majority of kids would specifically be from like Streatham, sometimes they'd randomly be from like Walthamstow, and it was all like within the same year group. Um, but then outside of that, like you know, you know, almost Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like Lucky Ten or whatever, like it really was like everybody else was. It, I guess even if they were from very different cultures, because it really was like, um, it was a university that had like lots of like international students and lots of kids from different backgrounds, but they all spoke the same language of money. They were all really rich. Like that was the thing, like, it was very much like, yeah. obviously, I don't know, they were rich in a way that was so kind of um, <laughs> excessive and alienating if you weren't, that like, it didn't even matter if like some one person's from like, um, you know, Singapore and another person's from like Ghana, if they're both like millionaires, they're still speaking that same language, it's the same school. Yeah. I, I'm shit you not, I went to university with somebody whose granddad was on the Naira, on the Nigerian currency, his face was literally on it. She was, t- I'm like, you literally are money. Like when you people say coming from, like, <laughs> physically came from money. And like, you know, that's the thing. Because it was, it was, am- it like, it was amazing. Like, and I mean that like, not necessarily that it was like, positive but it was genuinely so eye-opening to go to university and meet other Nigerian people that a like didn't I recognize me as Nigerian because like they actually lived there and I was like this second generation person that can't even speak Yoruba like can't even you know cook jollof rice um but then also kind of looked down on us as well because we were like common like because we weren't we weren't rich and obviously they were like even though they weren't like British, they were super duper rich. So it was like a really even even like at Warwick, where you know the the kind of homogeny wasn't necessarily cultural because there were lots of different cultures. It was just the fact that like it, there were some people who'd walk past the swans and thought it was normal, and then there were the others of us that had like never we had no reason to ever have seen a swan <laughs> anywhere outside of like a children's book, and it was just like yeah, it was just like cultural. I guess, yeah, like the, the class thing was probably something I've never really had to like contend with in my life. My, my secondary school was was a weird one. It was in Purley, which is kind of um, mixed. In, like Purley is quite like a like nice area, but like we the catchment area is very strange. So you had like lots of minority working class kids, lots of white working class kids, and then lots of like um, more affluent white and black um, kids. But like even then, because there were so many working class kids, it wasn't a huge deal whereas at Warwick it was like done like almost everybody was probably educated so that was like a real a real culture shock did you suffer from any sort of imposter syndrome oh in my you know what it was like I I don't think I'd ever experienced imposter syndrome before that because like I was saying this to my friend the other day that like I guess before like we live in a really different time now where like identity is very much in the forefront like you know you you can find out someone's like ethnic background, religious like views, sexual orientation from their bio. Like, I mean, as I said, I have like, I'm from Croydon, which is like a, you know, for me a really prominent part of my like identity. Um, But like, yeah, like people have their pronouns. People have like really big parts of themselves, like all like condensed into like bios. But for me, like growing up, like I knew I was black, I knew I was a woman. And I guess I knew I was working class, I suppose, like, I guess. But then even then my parents are educated. So it's, 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 I, get, I just thought, like, okay, I'm working class because we don't have much money. So that, that was my maths. But then as I got older, I realized that there are different things that feed into that as a definition anyway, in terms of class. But like, I kind of went through the world, like not really, I was completely unaware of how, what my positionality really was and what it meant. I didn't really, I guess now it's crazy. Like we really wake up and think about like, I'm privileged in this area, but I'm not privileged in that area. And I didn't, I just kind of was like, 
oh, my parents said I'm really smart and I can do anything. So I'm really smart and I can do anything. <laughs> I wasn't like, I mean, like my parents still gave me the, you know, you've got to work twice as hard thing, but I didn't really internalize it. So I kind of just thought everything was completely like fine. I was like, oh yeah, everything's like, um, you know, great until I guess like I became older and became very aware of like, you know, I think it was literally at university where I kind of first thought, like I, I did this module called like race difference and the society. I think I've said that wrong, but it was something like that. And that was the first time that I ever really kind of thought about um, like um, my, I re really thought about myself as a person who was in some way or could in some way be oppressed um, because they, they were talking about stats of like mental health and how like black people were given like stronger medications than white people um when when you know when sort of um what's the word dealing with mental health services and i, and I remember just sort of thinking wow like this this I, i'm a black person and i'm a black person that's had like mental health stuff so i remember thinking oh my god so if i was to go to this place like i could potentially if i was to go you know engage with mental health services um, I could potentially be given medication that they wouldn't give to white people. And I think that was the first time I ever really thought like, oh my gosh, there is some sort of, um, not obviously I was aware that racism exists, but it was the first time I'd really thought about how my positionality as a black woman like affected how I moved through the world. I'm really sorry because I was linking this to something, but I've completely forgotten your question. So I'm like, I had a point that I was trying, <laughs> trying to tie out. Imposter, Imposter syndrome, syndrome, thank you. I knew, I knew I was going somewhere with this. So. I definitely felt like I could do anything and didn't really realize how my identity affected like where I sat in the world. And now, and I don't know if this is necessarily a good thing, now I'm like hyper aware of like how my background feeds into mm. stuff and how my identity feeds into stuff. Now, like I, I, like I can't even describe like how much imposter syndrome like is, affects my life. In the, and very much the same thing with uni as well like that was kind of one of the first times where i became aware of like who i was or how the world saw me and and the idea that i shouldn't have been at warwick like in my brain i was like well of course of course i should have gone to warwick in fact my parents wanted me to apply to oxbridge but i didn't and i remember saying specifically i didn't and um i didn't want to because i was convinced i'd be the only black person and i was like i really don't want that um i'm, I'm gonna have to like trek on my own for like seasoning and stuff like that so i was like I and like <laughs> hairdressers i was like oh my god no thanks um and was just like forget it so i didn't apply but like in my brain i was like well of course i should have gone to warwick because i got like the grades to go to warwick but th there was just this continued narrative of like this is an exception and you should you know you should be really happy to be here and i was like why well, i really just sat down and did did exams and I, I did the exams to get to this place, if that makes sense. And like, it was like imposter syndrome all the time because it was very clear that only a particular type of person had grown up expecting to it occupy a space in a place like Warwick. But also it was like reverse imposter syndrome because I have consistently said, going to Warwick, like I can honestly say I had, I came across some of the most stupid people I have ever met. Like literally the most stupid people ever and i was like so wait a minute you mean to tell me these people literally have paid like their way through a system to be able to attend an institution like this and are still really dumb but like i've ended up here because it's their kind of birthright because they're rich and so it was like reverse imposter syndrome at the same time because i just felt like there are loads of people here that like if we went by grades or if we went by like rigor and or even just taking this institution seriously they wouldn't be here so it was kind of both it was weird didn't you have a really similar experience to that at the telegraph as well oh yeah oh my god the telegraph that was the telegraph was fascinating because like i think because because i was at the telegraph but i also did like some internships at other papers what that really showed me is that like every single paper was almost like exactly the same just like people kind of had marginally different like political beliefs, but like yeah, all of them yeah. had the exact same backgrounds, all of them were still really posh. Um, the Telegraph, I guess, wears it on its sleeve a bit more, but other publications I was at kind of act a bit more, like it's basically like the Telegraph with like, I don't know, like um, a snapback on and like a skateboard and being like, yeah, we're, we're <laughs> but they're exactly the same. But yeah, like the Telegraph was interesting. Like I feel like, like I almost have a weird like, I guess on my time there, and I know that it's like 
probably not what people would expect me to say because like obviously as an actual paper like I really don't like it but like they were quite they were genuinely kind to me there and I think also because I knew what I was I knew what to expect because we all know I mean it's called the bloody Tory graph for goodness sake like we know how how we expect them to be I think I was pleasantly surprised by how they were because they 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 gave me my first byline like they gave me my first like or at least paper byline they like really allowed me to create like to create like a portfolio of work in a way that like other institutions that kind of claim they're more committed to like diverse voices didn't but 100 percent, i did experience sort of walking around and thinking oh my goodness like you know i i think i when i got in i got in an internship scheme and had to absolutely work my ass off and i think the final three peak three people that they were looking at were all women one was um, Chinese, and there was me, I was obviously black, and then there was a white girl. And I think me and the Chinese girl got it. And this is before I think like diversity was really in the forefront of people's minds yeah. where it is now. But then what, which was, so that was a great thing. But one thing that was really like funny to see was just like one of the daughters of an editor, just like, like completely, you know, um, like bypassing that entire process, you know, just waltzing straight to the finish, like, finish line and then, being alongside us on like an internship as well and obviously that level of nepotism was like super frustrating and you know it's, it's not like she was completely like thick as shit but it was like me and the other girl who got it like we'd really had to work um and yeah there were definitely a lot of people that i kind of came across and was like wow this is maybe in like the 70s and 80s this person was like super impressive but like right now they've literally they literally come here they sit at their desk not to be ageist at all but like they re- they really are just on a paid like weird retirement scheme where they kind of like look at a screen for like four hours of the day don't actually do anything yeah. not earning more than like I, I i earn now 10 years into my career like um yeah there was a lot of that there was a lot of oh this person's a friend of the paper we're not going to sack them um until you know, journalism really went to shit and there were like mass sackings everywhere. But for a long time, there were loads of people that just kind of got by on being old and posh, so. It's it's really interesting that, that you didn't really feel the imposter syndrome until you were basically sat down and, and told, <laughs> told how different yeah. you are. Um, <laughs> Yeah, which is which is fucking crazy, really. But um, but I but I guess like the silver lining to that is is the fact that through all of these experiences, they have shaped your career yeah. coming out of it, and and it's a, like it's given you purpose and it's given you a mission to to sort of shine a light on this stuff that really by twenty twenty at this bloody time in in the world like these are things that really, really shouldn't Absolutely, be happening. Yeah, like, and that's the thing, because even when I was like, oh, I'm creating birthday and stuff, like, again, like, it's not like I felt like, oh, I can't do it because black girls aren't able to see the thing. I, I felt like, oh, I very much can do it because this other person's done it, so why can't I do it? Um, and I, even before I was aware that, like, you know, of what, like, as I said, like, of what, like, the world, I guess, of where I sat in the world and what that meant, like, for my future and stuff, or was supposed to mean for my future, I still was very big on, like, representation and feeling like, oh, you know, it's important that we hit, just just generally because, like, I'm a journalist and it's like, I like to tell stories. So I just found it g- genuinely, like, strange that <clears throat> there were certain things that were so huge within the Black community, the Black British community, and, like, the Black British working class community that just were completely, like, invisible in the mainstream press. So, like, for instance, like when I was growing up, I was obsessed with this channel, um, this like cable only music channel called Channel U, which later we, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. which we branded as like um, Channel AKA and like it had this really rich cultural legacy because um, it, it broke like 90% of today's grime scene. Like it was, it was huge. And like, there was just nothing on it on the internet. So I remember like nothing substantial, nothing that kind of archived like the work they'd done and who they'd broken. So like I, pitch like a documentary to kind of like find like who the celeb like the because you know you again i'm so sorry adam croydon keeps coming up i'm not even doing it on purpose <laughs> you, but but like obviously croydon definitely is an area that has that concept of like hood stars there were a lot of people that were like hood famous and famous in the area before they went mainstream so people like stormzy like he was like it's kind of like being a b knock but for like a whole county like so like he was like really kind of bait and like people really kind of had respect for him and then he went got famous and same with Crept and Conan from Fort and Heath like they were really respected in the area like, no, it's not like respected I guess rated like people they kind of like 
there was this weird culture where it's like you just kind of had people that did music and like everyone was kind of like oh there's that person and like a lot of them were like hood stars because they like were on channel u and channel u like was obviously on television but it still wasn't mainstream at all and i was like i can't believe that like channel u and like hood star culture and all that kind of stuff just hasn't really been like spoken about on a mainstream platform so i think that's kind of like where it started we just genuinely i think this is political i was just like these are stories that matter to me because these are the stories that like you know i care about because they're they're happening to me they're in my area that they're, they're like I, I can't really tell stories that aren't mine. And then as I got older, and again, I started to realize even more that like, it wasn't really a mistake that these stories weren't being told. It was because 94% of journalism was white and like um, something like 90% of journalists are like privately educated. I might have made that up, I can't remember, but it's something like that, probably more. And like, um, yeah, like it was, then I started to think more practically about it and be like, yeah, like this, it matters just beyond me being like, oh, I love to tell stories and, you know, we should really write about, you know, I, I, I did this slightly really viral but really old listicle about, um, I think it was something like 10 things you only know if you grew up in ends. And it was like, just these stupid things that just like, you know, it was such a specific culture, like in 2000, like rather 2K7 when like people used to kind of like dress a particular way, talk a particular way, do very specific things. And it went super viral. Um, that's only because my boss trusted that this was a very specific experience that people weren't really seeing spoken about. So he gave me that platform to tell that story and I was really very grateful for it. So yeah, I think it's just as time went on, it felt more like it mattered more, if that makes sense. It went beyond me just being like, yeah, it's cool to write stuff. And it became a bit more like, I actively want to kind of highlight certain conversations that aren't really being had. And, and I feel like you're redressing the balance because you you talk in slay in your lane about how when you're when you're a little girl you're buying magazines and stuff and you don't ever feel represented yeah. on the front cover of those magazines within the pages you're if you're reading harry potter then there's there's no black characters and and it's and it's like like how like how are we in this situation it's, it's so mad, crazy man. yeah magazines growing up was a big one because i'm like quite a girly girl and it's like well, I definitely was growing up. I was like, oh, I like, like, it's, it's weird though. Cause like, I think I was saying this in, a, I wrote this in an, I think an article I wrote last year where I was talking about like with black girls before I'd say the recent, maybe like past 10 years, like beauty boom of like YouTubers and stuff like that. You really get two camps of black girls where it's like some who kind of make, would make do like this back in the day, like would make do with like the really ineffective, um, you know, uh, like, really unbespoke like um high street offering which is like either nine shades too dark or like 12 shades too light and <laughs> just, like you know what i mean like just wore whatever kind of like yeah. what they could have and my mum was very much like that like she would just like there were you know there were these there were like some offerings like fashion fair and like um bobby brown and a mom's makeup line but there weren't many and then the other side were just like these black girls that just didn't really wear makeup at all um and that was kind of me like um it's probably why to this day i, I don't really wear makeup unless I have to or not really have to but like unless I'm going somewhere and I'm like being glam because like I grew up in a time where there just really wasn't that many offerings and I kind of never I think if I if there had been more kind of like stuff out there and it wasn't so hard to get and I could just pop into super like the idea of being able to pop into super drug like as a teenager and just find like your shade and just buy like a, a foundation for like four quid or something is it blows yeah. my mind so it was a real process for my mom like and my mom's very light-skinned like you know to, to go and find this shade and, and xyz so like and i think that's the thing like, so much of beauty pre-internet was magazines and it's like mm -hmm. i would literally buy magazines and it would be like plat like french braid your hair by da -da -da -da. and i'd just be looking at my afro like how would like my hair is going in a completely it's actually growing in a different direction it's a completely different shape circumference texture size everything like even when they talk about hair like falling it's like my head like was completely like you know how afros they just don't move they're just like static and and yeah. grow upward and i had like really big hair but like it was so interesting because i'd look at the magazines and they talk about like things falling down it's like my hair was growing out and i was like i can't i physically can't do this and same stuff with like hair was a big one but even with makeup it's like the you know this pink frosting like lip color that would just make me look insane and it was just like it was just do you know what i mean it was just it was just all our beauty cues kind of came from publications which is why like 
um, with birthday, I remember like, re- like I made sure that I had like, I found the darkest model. And, it, and it's weird because at the time I genuinely don't find it political, but like I found like the most stunning dark model, someone I went to uni with to um, front the cover. And at the time I was like 22 or something, 21. And it was genuinely just, it wasn't because I was like, yeah, this is some statement about like, you know how now it's like Vanity Fair and like we've got the first black photographer. Yeah. Yeah, it really wasn't that all this. We've got we've got the first do rag on Vogue, which is such an interesting first to have because <laughs> that first <laughs> Vogue are like, oh, we've got the first like do rag. And as someone who like wears do rags, I'm like, I mean, it's kind of like I I guess that I get that it's the first do rag, but it's kind of like I'm not surprised it's the first do rag because it's a do rag. It's kind of like the first shower cap on Vogue. I'm like, I use my do-rag to like secure waves in my hair. Like it's not re I know some people wear it's fashion, but I'm like, it that's a very interesting first. I feel like we're in a battle for the first these days. But anyway, like with the dark skin model, it was very much just like, oh, not only because she's stunning, but also because I don't really see dark skin models on um front covers. And that's kind of where it began and ended. And like, yeah, like it's it's strange that like, you know, I think that the changes have been like immense over the past few years because now like birthday <laughs> birthday wouldn't even be necessary now because there's so many publications doing what i was trying to do and better um but it's still interesting that like despite i don't know I, it's it's a weird one because like would i say the levels of representation have changed yeah because we have so many like you know from viola davis last like this week and simone biles on vogue the week before and like kiki palm on cosmopolitan the week before that you get loads more black women on magazines. I just don't know. I just don't know if, you know, sometimes I worry that like the change begins and ends with front covers, which we can all see, but we can't necessarily see who's pulling the front covers together behind the scenes. And it can't, mm, yeah. yeah, it shouldn't really stop there, but yeah. <laughs> That was what Lenny, Lenny Henry was talking about, wasn't it? With the with the yes, you've got okay, you've you've fulfilled the role of a black actor, but where but but who was the director, the editor, and the fact that there's only like only ever four black women have ever directed Quite, feature films yeah, in the insane. UK, like yeah, ju- just insane. I I think like I love this podcast because it allows me to it forces me to read books that i mm-hmm. probably like like your book is fucking amazing but it's called the black girl bible so the chances of me picking that up are Honestly. not that high but obviously i had to read it for for this interview and do i'm so <laughs> glad i read it and and honestly i would recommend it to any white person who just wants to to because because i think like i mean obviously our our I, I like to think that our listeners are, are fairly kind of down with what's going on and they and they I don't think there's many sort of racist people that listen to us and they are probably aware mm. of privilege. But it's not until you until you read stats like for only yeah. ever for black um female UK directors and and the fact that when you're reading a magazine as a kid like a third of yeah. it was useless to you and it's just I, I think you did such a good job in the book of, of pulling together these this is this is not like a theory mm-hmm. this is yeah. fucking oh, fact God. like here Thank it is in black so and white much. that was that was so intentional also as an aside i swear to god one of my favorite optics ever is just seeing unassuming white men like reading this hot pink book because it's like rose gold trimming like i just love it like <laughs> yeah like you know i love the book and i'm just like oh my god i just can just see you on the tube and everyone's just like what on earth is like, what on earth is going on there but yeah um, thank you because we were very intentional about like because so much of like black people's concerns and like black especially black women's concerns are like written off as like chips on shoulders and, and sometimes like i was saying like sometimes things are chipped on the shoulder but it's not a chip on the shoulder that you necessarily put there yourself like it stuff builds up over the years that creates this like level of defense that's kind of like understandable when you look at like the situations basically and it's like yeah like we felt like you know anecdote like for a start when elizabeth kind of like came to me with the idea and was like oh I think you should do this this is what I want to do and stuff initially we kind of just wanted it to be like focused on work and we also just wanted it to kind of be like um we're we're gonna like talk about our work experiences not even massively personally but just kind of like you know give whatever tips we can at like 20 
22 and 23 which so not many tips about navigating the workplace and then we were kind of like we just don't have the like range to be honest like who are we we're both like graduates and we don't know anything about work and this is why the book idea came about because she was like i don't know what i'm fucking doing at work and i was like neither do i and let's Let's tell people how to describe it. <laughs> we don't know. So we were just like, you know, our good is our guess is as good as anyone. So we were like, maybe we should find these women that have already kind of like done what we're hoping to do and have succeeded and slayed in their proverbial lanes. And then that's how we kind of got the idea of like interviewing um, the um, amazing women. But even their experiences, even despite all their expertise, we were like, this just can't be anecdotal because, you know, it's so easy when you kind of say like, oh, okay, yeah, like, okay, stop and search happens. And it's it's very prevalent within like certain um, areas of London because of predominantly black communities and people sort of like, okay, yeah, but how, how where, where are the receipts? How do we know that's actually happening? Like anything that you say is like immediately rebutted. And in a way I kind of, I'm like, I mean, I don't even, it's, it's understandable in my mind because I'm like, at the end of the day, some people of course are just playing devil's advocate and trying to like divert a conversation. Other people just genuinely don't know. And I think the way the conversation is going and how polarized it's becoming, it's not really giving people a benefit of a doubt for shit that I didn't even know and I'm black. Because I'm like, honey, I did not realize, like I did not know that people were like being given different types of medication based on their skin tone like i didn't yeah. know that until i went to university which again like hello a level of like privilege an elitist institution like i i it, even that i don't know i feel like sometimes the way the conversation gets polarized and stuff it's like it's almost i don't know it's almost like it's it's almost quite dangerous because it's like we're assuming people even have access to a sort, sort of level of education and knowledge that we often do if you are university educated we're kind of like extrapolating all this like information and data out to people that genuinely might not be aware of it so we felt like you know what whether it's going to be devil's advocates and just pricks that are bored and want to be like what about a white girl bible there's going to be that group of people but there's also going to be people <laughs> that genuinely don't know um because there's shit that we learned putting the book together so we were like let's make sure that we have actual kind of like receipts and we come with data and we're not just asking, we're not just appealing to people's like, you know, like sensibilities and like kind hearts. We're really just being like, this is this is what happened to this woman. This is something that happens to many women and many black women, that's what we're talking about. And here's the proof as to how, you know, here's why we know this alongside her experience. Here is the, the data that says that this is something, yes, that, you know, she's not, um she's not an aberration that this is what happens and yeah we had to you know when we talk about like having to work twice as hard to get half as much back putting together this book we were like i mean it's one hundred twenty thousand words we're like we're gonna have to gather like <laughs> twice as much fucking data <laughs> to get like half of the amount of people on board that we're trying to get on board kind of thing but also we were writing it for black women prim like literally primarily um so we were kind of like this is more for even us to ungaslight ourselves and understand that like oh my god like certain things that when i was a child like i mean you've read the book so you know that like i applied for or auditioned for like to be um sandy from greece in my like year six play and i was given the role of rizzo and like had to sing all sandy songs <laughs> like, <laughs> which was insane yeah, so so literally, the girl who who won the role of Sandy couldn't <laughs> sing. So because they knew you were the best singer, they rewrote the, the play. I'm like, okay, but it's like it was it was hilarious. It was like, you know, she they literally rewrote the play so that Rizzo randomly starts singing "Hope with these devotees." They could rewrite though because they made it like, oh, she was jealous of Sandy and Danny, so she's kind of hidden by this wall singing it. I was like, I remember something. Oh, that's quite a smart. Um, rewrite and I like, told Elizabeth and Elizabeth was like you know I me mean? that is the most racist thing ever. <laughs> and I was like wow but yeah like it made me I felt weird about it at the time but I didn't think about it along racial lines so I was like 11 I genuinely thought oh well she's blonde and mm. I'm always a stickler for casting and really hate it when people don't look like who they're supposed to be cast so I at the time I thought oh yeah okay well she's blonde and got blue eyes and I don't look anything like Sandy. But then I thought, wait a minute, I don't look anything like Rizzo. So where are they going with this? Like, they could have just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, like, I think I felt weird about it when I was um, younger. I was like, oh, this is this is strange. But then being able to read certain things that we wrote in Sang Lane when we're like, 
gathering the data, I was like, oh yeah, like so I wasn't insane and it wasn't like all imagined. And I think, yeah, we just wanted black women to feel like valid, like their experiences were validated. And then for people that weren't black women, it's just it's just evidence, it's just receipts. But that wasn't even our primary concern. So when you started writing the book and you wanted to get people to interview, yeah. how did you approach that? Because I imagine when you've got nothing to start with, yeah. it's like, we've got this idea, like we'd like for you to get involved in it. How did you convince people to come along on that journey with you? <laughs> That's one of my favorite questions because it's just, there was no, it was just like, I think most people think there was some method like to the madness, like we had this whole plan and we're really professional. But when I say it was just as basic as DM slides, like it was literally just like, I swear to God, like we met, um, there's this annual festival called um, Afro Heron Beauty that like I've been attending like since I was a child. It's like a really big expo in central London for like loads of different vendors of like hair and beauty and all this kind of stuff. Um, and like loads of black women attend. And like me and Elizabeth had seen this like basically rumor or like this post somewhere saying that June Sarpong was coming. So we were like, oh yeah, we should go. So we can of course June Sarpong in person and ask her to like be part of our book. And we literally pre-book deal, we literally saw her. She was like campaigning um but like you know flipping brexit for us to stay in so you know like that was how long ago was that like four years ago five years ago yeah. and like we saw her and we're like hey june you don't know us but we know you <laughs> book. and like, we're like we don't have a book deal yet and like literally halfway through just like okay yeah that's cool hey like tapped her like agent or whoever was with her and was like oh can you give these girls our email and we were literally like waiting for the like bounce back like of course she's just giving us like june at like sarpong dot like, we're just like this is this is fake but then like literally we emailed it and then she put like an invite in the in our diary and we, and we interviewed her and we literally went to parliament to try and interview diane abbott because she was doing this like i don't even know what it was there was some sort of like talk going on in her chambers and maybe jeremy corbyn was doing something and we literally went and accosted her afterwards and like, you know, true, true Diane Abbott style, so just kind of like, you know, this really like, okay, like a really like pained grin, like, okay, like <laughs> what do you guys want from me? And like, literally she just, she was lovely, but she was literally just like, you know what? Like, I have to be real with you girls. Like, I don't really know if I'm gonna have time for this, but you know, take my number, which was her real number. And like, you know, we'll see what happens. But I think to be honest, this was God, like speaking to why like a book like Selena Your Name Matters, I think, one of the reasons she wasn't able to take part, when we look back, we realised that it kind of coincided with that period which was getting like the worst abuse ever. So that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, like yeah. we, we DM Vanessa Kingori from British Vogue on flipping Instagram, like, hi Vanessa, we're writing a book. Um, we haven't got a book deal yet, but we'd love it if you could be in it theoretically. And she was like, yeah, sure. And, and we're just like, this is insane. Like we just, like there was a point Naomi, we got this close to interviewing Naomi Campbell, like because we just reached out to her agency and they're like, oh, this sounds important. And we did interview Tandy Newton. That's the story for a completely different podcast because as you can see, David, did not make it into the final cover. <laughs> but that's a completely different story. But she was amazing um, and very, like very, very, very interesting person. But like, yeah, like we just, it was so basic, like, you know, and again, I think, I, I, I look back on it and I'm like, would I have the confidence to do that now? I don't think so. Because I'm just like, we literally were just like, I worked at ITN, I saw Charlene White in the women's toilets and like she was wa literally washing her hands and I'd like just come out of the toilet and was like, hey, Charlene White of um, ITV News, my name's Yomi and I work up there and she was just like, okay, so what, what, where are we going with this? I was like, yeah, we'd love you to be in the book. And she was just like, do you guys have a book deal yet? And we're like, no, but, and she was like, okay i guess like you know here's my email like she was like we, we worked in the same office so she was like you'll know you'll know my email like um what's the word like form. oh the format yeah. yeah and then i emailed her and then yeah she said that she'd do it so it was literally just like asking which i know that like it sounds so basic but like when people are oh, if you don't ask you don't get that was like the biggest example of that i've ever seen because people so many people said yes and that's even before we had anything substantial to like really say this was happening and they just agreed because they wanted to help which was amazing you you dropped a little something in there you were like i don't think i'd have the courage to do it now and look look man look if if the chips are down you know you know 100 you're gonna do to what you honest. need to do that's true so yeah and you you've now got a track record of like you know you can yeah. do these things you know you can deliver and, and I think because it comes down to 
because like you're young when you're writing this book and a lot of people get in touch with us and, and they're like I can't do anything because I'm young, which means I haven't yeah. done anything. Oh so, so like, so, so where do yeah. I take that first, that, yeah, it's that catch 22. But like, I mean, that's where you always say is like, we'll talk to experts then. And if your idea is pure, then that's when you get people on board. And that's like, you're living proof. Yeah, that's exactly what you did. Absolutely. And that's the thing though. And that's why I think youth is such a like, it's such a like weapon in like an amazing way and something we just don't even realize how valuable it is when we have it. Cause when I was, it's true, when I was like 21, it really was that catch 22 of like, I need work experience, but I need work experience to get work experience. And it's, I was just stuck in this loop of like, I won't be hired for work experience unless I show I have experience, which is why I was like, I'm gonna start a blog. I'm gonna start this magazine. And then I kind of created my own work experience. And I feel like now, yeah. like the barrier to entry for anything is so low. You can create a Twitter account, an Instagram account for free. You can create a website for, if not free, very, very cheap. It's very easy to kind of create your own platform from just the ground up. But like when I'm like, cause honestly, I, I look at myself back then, I'm like, God, I was literally really out here like printing a whole like print publication i was sliding into the dms of like some of the most amazing women and people in the country i'm just feeling no way about it but that's the thing i think sometimes about being young is you just it's like what do you have to lose you just don't really care whereas now i'm like you know yeah. i'm like now i'm a, a, a season 28 year old which like isn't even that old but <laughs> feels like you know like honestly like, i feel like i feel like the work i do really ages me because often i'm you know, going into institutions and talk, sit, I remember like, I was watching this show yesterday called um, Has Britain Changed? And it was about like, you know, how much Britain had or had not changed since the murder of Stephen Lawrence, right? And like, I was watching it and I saw Sean Bailey, the MP on it. And I remember thinking, oh my God, when I was like 21 or something, like I was on the like radio, like having a big back and forth with him. And I was just like, I cannot imagine myself at 28 like ha even having the like gumption and confidence to like really take him on like i did then but i think you're right like i've pr proven that i can do these things but i think when you're young sometimes it's just this like i just don't give a shit because the worst thing that can happen is probably that like i'm not as good at something as i think i am and it, and that's not going to kill me whereas like when you get older there's all this pride and you feel like oh i might lose this or i might embarrass myself whereas like when i was younger like i, it's cr I did so many like random radio like beefs like i'd just be constantly like saying all this stuff and now i'm just like constantly declining everything so it's like oh my god like i don't want to like do xyz but yeah no i think you're right if i was thrown into that position again to do certain things then i would but like back then it was just like yeah it, it was insane to just be so kind of confident and self-assured and like that's why i think it's weird sometimes when the more you think about who you are and like statistics and stuff like that sometimes it really can be a like a weird hindrance because like I've, yeah. someone tweeted that they've never felt so aware of like their their position of like being oppressed and someone asked me the other day like off the back of the George Floyd protest a, a journalist asked me oh would you say that black people are second class citizens in the UK and I was like this is such an interesting question because I was like you know what some are like some black people are set second class citizens in the UK you know Grenfell the black and brown and white people that died in that fire died because they were, you know, second class citizens in their own country. But I'm like, at the same time, I have to be able to differentiate that, like, I couldn't have died in Grenfell because I don't live in council housing. I, I did at one point, I don't remember when I was like two, but I was like, it's interesting that that question is asked because I was like, I'm literally like a, a columnist in like a flipping national paper and like I'm an author. And yes, I, live, I still live in Croydon, but it's like, I felt kind of weird about saying like, I don't know, I felt like I was opting into oppression that isn't necessarily even mine, because of course there's race, but then there's class, and then there's a, a, bit, a physical ability and all these different things. And it's interesting because that girl that was tweeting about, you know, saying, oh, I've never felt so aware of like my, how I'm supposed to be oppressed. It's like, I absolutely know that my race and my gender and the two, the toxic, the toxic combination that those two create in terms of misogynoir, I know that that impedes me, but, I don't think I've ever felt as keenly aware of how it's supposed to impede me, but also knowing that I'm doing all this amazing stuff that then I'm doing in spite of, but I'm still doing. So I have to be, sometimes I feel like I have to be careful in ensuring I don't fall into a trap of like opting into oppression that I'm not necessarily facing. And that, you know, sorry, this is a bit of a tangent, but like, I feel like even with the conversation we currently have around like racism and around like the post George Floyd kind of like conversation we're having around like Rachel, um, inequality 
sometimes I feel like the conversations we have focus very much on people like me. Af- like, oh God, I was about to say affluent. I'm like, I need to calm down because I still... <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly not affluent, but like you know, upwardly mobile, me- visible, like black people in the media with book deals, and you know, influencers that are like you know, talking about like the pay gap, which really, really matters. But then who gets left behind are like actual like the black people who are most likely to be affected by the upcoming recession. Key workers, people like Betty Majinga who died because someone spat at her. People like Trevor Bell who died because someone spat at him when he was driving his Uber. She was working at TFL. Do you get what I mean? I feel like the focus sometimes goes on people like that are kind of like already doing okay and leaves behind a lot of minorities that are yeah. really a lot more, you know, impeded. So yeah, I still try to bear that in mind because I'm like, cause all things considered, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not doing, doing too badly. But yeah. <laughs> Well, there's one thing you said um, that I actually love this phrase. I never heard it before. It was like, keep your receipts. Yeah. And I love that idea of like being able to just like look back at what you've done. Absolutely. And that's a good way to kind of grow confidence in looking where you've come from. Absolutely. Like I was, I said this, I was doing another podcast with Galdem and like it, their whole, the whole thing is about like looking backward and seeing like, you know, how far you've come and stuff and they I, they were like you know you need to find something that you wrote like a long time ago um and like read it out and see how far you, you've come since so i was like okay cool and like um i found like this application i did for like um to be an mtv blogger like what a random position like i don't, I don't even know why they have that as a thing but like an mtv <laughs> blogger for this specific youth platform they were doing back then i think it was called sticky or something and like i was like i remember like applying for it when i was 21 and it like made you list these five things that you wanted to have achieved and like they were all really like cute and like very like straightforward like i want to prove to my parents that journalism is a viable career choice and i want to be like have a full-time position like as a journalist and like Obviously, like, I, I don't have a full-time position as a journalist now, but that is, that's literally my decision. And because I've decided that freelancing works better and stuff. But it's been, but reading, like, these really kind of basic things that I felt were, like, so unachievable and, like, I was really, like, it's weird because like, I was saying that, like, I I was super confident um, and truly had a lot of self-belief, belief, but at the same time, I still did, I still did look at journalism and know that, like, at this point, I think I was like trying to get into internships and stuff. And I did realize that literally nobody looked like me. And that's me. And I have a sister who, my older sister is a journalist um, in, at BBC Africa. And she looks exactly like me and she was a journalist. And I still felt like nobody looked like me in journalism. Like I was literally like, oh my God, like it's it's so like hard and so far. And I'm so glad I still have that application um, because I look back on it and I'm like, wow, like, you know, it's cliche to say, but like young me really would be like so proud because um these were things that at the time however many years ago like eight years ago felt completely worlds away from me and also just like i don't know like yeah i think i think i she would be really proud and i think also like keeping those like rejections which at the time just felt like so world crushing and spirit crushing and i'm just like i i could not tell you how many um rejections i got for internships for jobs but even things like there's nothing more demoralizing than being like um rejected for an unpaid internship <laughs> like it's just like, it's like, oh, yeah. it's like oh my god like you don't even want my free labor this is this is painful but like there's so many things that like um you know i i, I still have and i like have gathered them and sometimes like <laughs> i'm one of those like really like i'm like a very cheerleading kind of person and like really like love to like push people probably too much i like I, I fear for whenever i do have children because i'm definitely like a sucker mom or whatever but like i, I literally, <laughs> like will read sometimes to like when my friends feel like demotivated about applications i would literally like show them like just the fucking pages and pages of those i got because it's just like they were so frequent you, that whole like oh you just need one foot in the door like that lady gaga thing you need one person out of, i can't remember the exact quote hundred thousand or something to believe in you like it's just so true once you get your foot in the door like everything else just like is so much easier but yeah like being able to look back and see how far i've come is just like it's just it's just crazy like it's 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 nuts i'm very i'm very, i always say this i'm i'm a lot less hard on myself than other millennials are because i'm constantly like if i tapped out for like the next two years like three years if i tapped up till i was like 33 and i came back at exactly doing what i'm doing now i'd be like yeah you go girl you're not doing badly like i would feel like it's fine like i feel like i i'm ahead of where i wanted to be at this point so yeah i'm proud 
And if you were to write that list of five now, what do you reckon would be oh, on that? Oh, no. I was just like, please. I was literally thinking that. Don't ask me that because I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Like, that's your that's homework. That's my bloody homework. I, I need, I've been saying, it's so annoying because like, I keep saying to people, like, oh, yeah, like I'm like the queen of not practicing what she preaches because I'm like, everyone is more mindful. Like, we need to think about, I, was, I did this whole speech on the other podcast I was on. I was like, yeah, like, you know, we don't think about why we want what we um why we want what we want like you know where if someone like posts that they've started a new writing gig here then we look at them and we're like oh i should probably start a new writing gig somewhere and we don't really engage with why because we just take all these subliminal messages about what success looks like from online and we just completely swallow it all yeah. and we don't really even know if like they match up to what we actually want so i'm always like we need to like engage with like because I mean, I, I remember like at university applying to like work at Barclays, like to be like some corporate city slicker in Canary Wharf at Barclays. And I'm just like, what was I thinking? Like, ha- look at me, look, I have no hair. Like I, I have like these enormous chunky earrings on. Like, I'm just like, there's, I would have stuck out like an absolute sore, sore thumb. At the time when I applied, I think I had like baby blue braids. I'm just like, it was media industry or bust. There's no way I could have survived. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no way I could have survived um, Canary Wharf. Um, but, like I remember applying literally because at my NCS, Afro Caribbean Society, everybody was on this like, you know, PWC, Deloitte, like that whole tip. And I was like, that yeah, success. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, and again, as I said, I had these cool parents that kind of were like, as long as we're getting A's and whatever you're doing, we don't really care. Like, but I was internalizing it. And I think we do the exact same thing online, even in like creative spaces. Like, you know, the amount of people that I think are multi hyphenates more because they think they have to be rather than because they actually like to do multiple things. It's like, yeah, shit, yeah. if I don't learn how to, like, speak on a panel or, like, you know, like, do if I don't learn how to, like, write a column, if I don't learn how to do this, then I'm somehow falling behind. Like, people don't really, like, like having one vocation they throw their wall in. I'm a, I'm a multi and I like doing yeah. loads of different shit, but I have to make sure I'm not doing random shit just because I think I have to. So uh, for this whole, like, what, what am I doing what, with my next few like next five years, five things be. That's why I guess I've been like struggling so much to think about it because I'm trying to work out what I want and and try and disconnect it from what I think I want because yeah, yeah that's what other people right? have and exactly. do. Exactly, or because yeah. it's the traditional route because like lots of writers eventually go on to be editors. I don't want to be. I read a brilliant piece years ago. I was talking about how we're losing some of our best writers to editorial positions because the trajectory is you go you go from being a writer to an editor, but it's a completely different job. And I'm not, I'd probably be a rubbish yeah. editor. So I'm like, I don't really want that. So for years I was like, oh, I want to be an editor. But I could not tell you why. I was like, it's because it's the thing, it's the thing you do. So that five, it's the ladder, the ladder yeah. right? So I think the five things would probably be like, probably like just names of different children because i'm constantly like i like, <laughs> yeah i'm like that it's like i literally i don't know I, I really um i've been saying for ages like you know i i'm cautious that i'm i'm trying to like remember that i have a life outside work because i think i'm so i've never been massively believe it or not i swear i've never been massively like ambitious before slaying your lane or before i'd say birthday was kind of the tipping point i was never really ambitious i was just like you know like I, I just want to be okay at something and be pretty good at it and get on with life like and and smell the flowers and all that kind of it. but then obviously when birthday started and then selling your lane started and then all these opportunities came i just kind of been like a rat on a I don't know why I said, I said a rat on a hamster wheel rather than a hamster on a hamster wheel. <laughs> it's probably some like psychological thing there. Like, but yeah, like, I, I'm like, I feel like I'm just always on the go. But I'm like, I really do want to slow down. And I know it's probably not the fashionable thing to say, but I'm like, oh, I want, I want kids and I want like to move to the country and I want like a massive fuck off house. But the thing is, in the country, but probably pearly because that's, that's quite leafy. But I'm like, to do that, I'm gonna yeah, have- Pearly Oaks. But yeah, right? Uh, that would be great. <laughs> and there's good schools around there. <laughs> but I'm like, if I was to like, do, if I want that, I know I have to put in the work now, which is the annoying bit. Um, so like, yeah, I'm, I think, I guess I'm trying to work towards that because I, I definitely don't want to end up like having my life pass me by. And I think with the, I know every time I bitch about the internet, I know it makes me, it ages me like another 40 years. But like, I really do think there was this thing of like, I don't know like it never stops so you never stop and you just never get to really think about what it is you actually want want and i've always sort of said that when i used to play the sims like addictively i was such a family sim i used to like make families like all my sims were family sims or romance sims because they were really into like 
like connections and love and like family yeah. and stuff. I was never a business sim. I never really cared about the simoleons. I was like, <laughs> I, was all about, <laughs> I was all about family. So I'm like, you know what? I, I want to make sure I don't lose that part of myself because like everything's just about hustle now. So I'm trying to get like some perspective before um, I'm too old to like think about stuff like that. I have the Sims metaphor that David never played the Sims, so he doesn't get it. But I almost think like in life, because you've got to think like all these, when you play the Sims, you've got all your different health bars for all yeah. the different elements of your life. And I feel like if you don't concentrate on all of them, some things will just get completely depleted. Oh my So God. it does take, <laughs> exactly. Like is that. You wet yourself, you drown in the pool. You're me- you remember when Sims like, what's the word? They, they would wet themselves. Like whenever something goes wrong, it's like they wet themselves. They, they're like, um, when they have their like mental breakdowns in like the Sims 2. Sorry, David, this is yeah, now, this is like... me and Adam's Croydon. Right? <laughs> We're just like, but you know, it's like, it's so true. Their social bar's like empty and then they can't do anything else. <laughs> their social bar's empty and they can't do anything else. That's exactly how I see it. I see it's like, you ha- there has to be balance. That's actually a very good analogy that I might steal. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm very- Go for it, yeah. I'm what's the word? Sim analogies and like puns are like something that I've like, yeah quite prevalent in my life generally so yeah that'd be that'd be a useful addition but yeah i think it is, is really important to just step back and like analyze your life from outside and just kind of think like what do i see myself as yeah. now and what would i like to become rather than because it is so easy to just get stuck in this rat race of being yeah. like hustle i've got to keep going because everyone else is going yeah. And actually, it's fine. Like, if you, I'm going to go another metaphor now, but like in like Formula One, for example, it's like you have to take pit stops, otherwise, your tyres are going to go, you're going to run out of fuel. Exactly. And it's like, yes, you're going to stop for a minute, everyone's going to whiz by, but then you're going to catch straight back up again yeah. because at some point, they're going to need to stop exactly. too, whether that's because yeah. they stop and have a break or they just have a breakdown because exactly. they've not stopped themselves. Look, I, I think that's it's really self, uh, self-aware self of you. And it is one thing that we always say is like, it, we start a lot of when we do um kind of one-on-ones with people, we start a lot, a lot of times we'll just start with like, what do you want? Because most people don't know. Uh, we interviewed um, Jamal Edwards at the, like, the beginning of this series and he like he won't do keynotes. And we all know how much money there is in keynotes. It's it's huge, but like he's he's like, it's just not. I just don't oh want to do god. that. Like you can't. You could never pay me enough money to do that. Oh my god, that's that's incredible that he doesn't do you know because I shit you not. I have an absolute like um <clears throat> like strict rule that like with any events we're asked to do, minute they're like, can you guys? If it's me and Elizabeth, and they're like, can you do a keynote? We can have a conversation about it, and sometimes like you know like. I guess with there being two of us, like not need, even if one of us blanks, the other one can kind of like fit it in or whatever. But yeah, I, we have the same, yeah. right? But with like I me mean, as an individual, I just don't. I just don't like keynotes. I don't. I don't like them, and also I don't think I'm. I. I mean, I. I don't think I'm great at them, and I don't think that is where my strength lies. Do I think that I could kind of like learn to be like oh, all right? Yeah, I do because I speak publicly anyway. It's like part of my job. But it's something that I just don't enjoy. It's kind of like hosting. Like when it comes to like, I love panel events, but when it comes to actually having to like moderate, I hate it. So I always charge like, a, like I charge like treble what I charge to show up on a panel because I don't, it's something I don't like. With keynotes, you could never pay me enough. I'm like, that being said, obviously, <laughs> if anyone <laughs> wants to offer me a million pounds, then yeah. But like, honestly, it's like, it's good for Kamal that he knows that because I'm like, you know, it's really, especially when there's like money as an incentive. It's like, you know, I've, been asked so many times to do keynote talks or speeches or whatever and I'm just like I don't I don't like them so I don't want to do it um and I don't want to be in a position where I feel like I'm, I'm incentivized by money and like I feel like I have to do something because of how much I'm being paid to do it which is why I'm trying to like basically make my money elsewhere and be financially secure so I can comfortably say no to things and I feel like I'm reaching that that I think I have reached that space where it's like I can say no to something because I don't feel like I need to, I need to do it to be able to like pay my bills or whatever. Um, and I feel like, yeah, like also compromise. Like often when people say, oh, can you do a keynote? I come back with, I'm not really, I'm not really keen on them to be honest, but like if there's some sort of in conversation style event or like a different format that you'd be interested in, I'd be happy to do that. But other, but if you're just going to ask them to stand up and sort of, you know, do a monologue like to people about yeah. stuff, I promise you it's not worth the money that you're going to try and pay me from it's yeah. not it's not I my heart won't be in it so yeah 
a lot of event organizers as well are really open to yeah. that. I, I, you just you just have to suggest it. You just have to go. I won't do a keynote, but yeah. I will do an interview. Here's who I'd like to be interviewed by. And and I, I think a lot of times this is something that I learned from uh, Viv Goscrop of of like you you have to ask and so uh, me and adam have been on panels before where we've been sitting in really uncomfortable mm -hmm. chairs and one thing i got from her was like you need to just if you, when you get there and you sit in the chair and it's uncomfortable you need to just say can we change the chairs and someone will change the chairs yeah. for you but but a lot of times what we do is we just turn up to these events and we go right you're there you're yeah. there when i like here's your mic and, and you just kind of you're like oh it's all going on but we need to like stop and go no, here's the format that works for yes. me. I need to be, I, I need to be sitting, if that's your preferred. Mm. I need to be standing because I use my hands a lot and I walk around the stage. Whatever it is that works for you, just just let the event owner know. Absolutely, a hundred percent. And it really is. If you don't ask, you don't get. Like we, and if if you do ask and you still don't get, then you can at least walk away if it's not worth it yeah. for you or if you're not comfortable with it, or at least you go into it not feeling like you're, you know, you've just been kidnapped and thrown somewhere. Like at least if you ask and they say that they can't budge and you can't budge, then you know it just doesn't necessarily work. But as you said, sometimes like I've just shown up and I've been pointed around and it's like, oh, you sit here, you do that. And then you're supposed to then give like some, you know, really passionate, really thought out, really life changing, like speech or whatever. And you just don't feel comfortable. You can't deliver because you haven't, yeah, your, your needs haven't been addressed essentially. What advice would you give to people who want to work or start something with their best friend? I would say if you don't, if you love your best friend, but you don't respect your best friend, don't start it. A hundred percent. That's it. If you don't respect your best friend, you cannot do this because me and Elizabeth's like relationship, we have like, it's so insane because pre Selenia Lane, I w we would literally be on the phone for like four hours about absolute incessant nonsense and just bullshit and gobbledygook. We just would talk about absolutely anything. Now we've had to very much be like two hours to like bitching, gossip, <laughs> bullshit. The other two hours is like, you know, serious, like business talk, like, you know, proper like book talk and all that. And I feel like we have, we definitely, it's weird. Like we have to relate, like our relationship has now kind of like split in two where we have our business side and we have our friendship side and they are quite separate. Like we literally have, it's weird. We genuinely have like one chat where we just talk about like bullshit and send each other like screenshots of like nice shoes. And then another, which used to be a chat, but like one of the other members left. So now it's just me and Elizabeth. And in that chat, we literally put like work stuff so they don't mix. It, it, it sounds insane, but that's literally how we operate. And I feel like, People kind of see it as sometimes people see it as like, oh wow they're working so well together because you know she's like they're like a Yomi's like a sister to her and you know you guys like get on so well like you've spent Christmases together like she's lived with you and your family before you guys are so close yeah that's all true but that's not why we work well together it's because there is a mutual respect I have a lot of respect for Elizabeth as a business brain as a marketing brain as a writer and I know that works the same way back and like because I respect her ideas when she says this is what I think about this thing. I will never feel like I have the right to kind of just shoot her idea out of the like park or whatever, or, or just like be like, oh, well, I don't agree with that because I think it's rubbish. Like, even if I don't agree with it, I can, I respect her acumen enough to kind of be like, okay, I don't necessarily think this is right, but let me see where you're coming from. And sometimes like, you know, 99% of the time we have the same, like we always have the same vision we just don't always have the necessarily the same route of getting there most of the time we do but on the odd chance that we don't most of the time once we've explained one side to each other like one of us will end up defecting to the other side anyway because she's smart i'm smart so no one's putting forward complete and utter, like bullshit here like most of the time it's just like a slight kind of difference and mo and again i've never really believed really in like right and wrong often like i really believe that most things exist in the gray area so often when she presents something it's not that it's wrong it just might be different to how I want to do it and vice versa but usually you know we always talk about the greater good and how saying your name's bigger than us so it becomes quite easy to just kind of be like okay well what would serve the community of readers best the community that follow us on Instagram and Twitter best and we just go through we do it like that but as I said that we can only operate in that way because there's a mutual respect like it's it's not all like it's not all about like lovey doveyness and oh really liking each other. It's about do you rate this person? Do yeah. you rate their ideas? Do you feel like do you know what I mean? Like do you trust them to make decisions that are executive when you're not around? Do you trust their taste? Like just things like that. Um and 
I think the answer to those things is like, yes, therefore, you know, we always compare it to, we always say that like me and Elizabeth will go into the same shop, look at the same dress, buy the same dress and wear it completely differently. Like that's, we have very similar, like, it's just the outcome. We, we always going towards the same thing, but sometimes it's different about how, how, we'll, how we'll arrive. And like, um, because cause we like, you know, aside from all the like closeness, really trust each other's judgment. It, it makes it a lot easier for sure. Yes. But yeah, if you don't have, yeah, and you shouldn't assume just because you're friends with someone as well that you have that. Because I know loads of people that are friends with people and do not rate them and do not respect them. And it's about understanding that's not a given. Yeah, because I suppose it's like you would have gone into business with her even if you weren't friends. Exactly that. Exactly that. Like, it, it, it works both ways. Like, I always say that if she'd have given, she tried to give me the book idea and I was like, you know, I think we could do this together because this is what you bring. And, and that says a lot as well. The fact that she could see that I was, she believed in me enough to write the book, but I also believed in her enough back to think she could also write the book. Yeah. Like, I would say that if I had just done it on my own, like, I would have still brought Elizabeth to all the events anyway because we're so close, because we're like best friends. But also, as you said, if if we'd done it together and I hadn't known Elizabeth before, like, I would have, sorry, if I hadn't have known Elizabeth before, I'd have still done it with her because I respect her work and I think she, she would bring something incredible to the um, process and she has. So, yeah. I could literally talk to you all day, but I think we've we've gone a bit long, so we'll we'll probably have to wrap it up. But um, what would be your um your parting advice to um any creatives listening? Oh God, I don't want to sound. I always feel like I sound so Disney, and I'm always like, believe in yourself, or you know, oh, believe in your this. But honestly, I feel like truly, like I always say, authenticity over everything. Like I just don't think many things can fail when they're in when they're authentic. I think many things fail when they are inauthentic. Like I feel like you know, just one of the reasons that I was able to kind of make any kind of like splash in journalism is because I was writing about what I authentically cared about. Like I wasn't trying to parrot like you know the pre-existing voices because they're pre-existing and they're enough of them already. And I felt like I wasn't again. I wasn't really actively trying to carve out a niche, and you know, I wasn't really being intentional with it. But honestly, I really just um wrote about things that were my lived experience and that like I was one degree of separation from or no degrees of separation from and just felt like oh I've never really seen an article and like and and that's just the crazy thing about when you have an experience or like you're from a community that isn't really represented in the mainstream me media because it's just endless like endless things that are hiding in plain sight like endless like you just look at something and it's like has anybody ever written about like you know, I, I mean I'm currently trying to write about um African African parents and the kind of um, their kind of um, what, what's the thing? African parents have a really bad habit of like hoarding, and like it, it's like this. It's a really well known thing that like if you just type it on Twitter, like African parents hoarding, you'll just see all these second generation kids being like, "Why the fuck have I got? Like, why has my mum got birthday cards from the eighties? Like, what what are they doing in here? Like, what like what? and they, and it's just a really like." prevalent thing and I just sit there and go because I've been trying to like write about it for a while and I'm like why have why when I type in African parents hoarding does it just come up with like sociological like and philosophical and psychology psychology papers like because no journalist has like even though like because there no there's like three black journalists so like no one's yeah. been able to like take and it's just like how I was saying about the channel you thing which was like such a cultural staple there's so many I'm like I'm currently working on like some um thing about like um, black British couples and like how you know black black relationships like black people tend to date outside of um, their community more than any other race and I'm like I find it so bizarre that that's just a fact and you know you type that in and there's nothing really on it it's yeah, just kind of like just the that stats. Thing, yeah right? it's just that and I'm like I think there's just so much stuff that's hiding in plain sight and when you're from a minority community and you're not represented in the media it's just endless you're like there will be so many things that are just constantly like you know why are all why are the majority of um hair shops in um the UK afro hair shops owned by South Asian men there's a whole reason behind that I wrote a piece on it but it was like I remember thinking how has there never been a piece on this before like it's it's we all know it we all yeah. see it and it's like I went to go and speak to some of the owners and they explained why and they explained how the like systems work and why that and why that is and why we see so few black people owning those shops. So yeah, I feel like it's important to just to just stay true to you because what you're what 
might seem completely mundane and normal to you and not really even that interesting to you. Like I guarantee you 99% it's not even 99% of the time it's not even being covered in the mainstream press. It's just asking why. If you're interested in something, ask yeah. why it is that way. Yeah. Exactly that. Why we 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 just we accept so many things as normal and we don't really interrogate like why these things are happening and that's in our own lives but also in like the news yeah. we don't really not really get into like we're just like, oh it's just that way and usually like nothing is just that way do you know what i mean and i think there's so many like and that's the thing as well i'm like if you're a min- minority writer as well i'm like please don't fall into the trap of feeling like you have to <laughs> like Beyonce does something and all these editors start to scramble and be like, quick, can you like shit out and I like shit out a take on this? Like, please don't fall into that trap because like that give yourself that time to marinate and think about what you actually think. Because so like even the George Floyd thing, like I didn't write an immediate piece because I was just like, I don't know. I want to really understand and engage with what my thoughts are on this. And then I wrote this word vomit piece about the fact that I hated the fact that everyone felt like they had to perform their grief online. And that did really well. But I know if I had just done this immediate reaction, I was like, this is what I think. I didn't know what I thought. I, I knew I thought it was fucking horrendous, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it wasn't the first piece of police brutality I'd seen that year, this year. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, this is like, I want to think about like how I'm going to tackle this. But I think minorities, you know, we are usually very, we're, we're waiting on editors to kind of ring us up when there's another horrible thing that's happened and for us to shit out something really like, effortlessly and that often doesn't give us the space to really provide like the takes that we want to that are like more multifaceted and nuanced yeah. and layered because we're reacting immediately so i'm always like that if that doesn't feel authentic to you like don't do it i think you're such an important person and you are you are bringing around these changes so um thank you, thank you. um so could you let everyone know where they can find you online um they can find me on twitter where my at is just my name yomi Adele, okay and they can find me on Instagram, where my at is just my name, but the full stop between my first name and second name. So you're my daughter, okay? Boom. Thanks so much. Amazing. And we'll uh, we'll have to come back because I need to know about Tandy Newton. So. Oh, my God. Guys, buckle up. That will be your <laughs> longest ever. <laughs> and your most listened. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hey, guys. As promised, we've got another competition for you. Every week as part of this partnership with Adobe, we're giving away a free mentor session with myself and David and a year subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud. The full run is up every week. Also get another year subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud. Inspired by our awesome episode today with Yomi, we want you to get podcasting with Adobe Audition. If you've never used Audition before, there's loads of great tutorials on the Adobe website. So go and check them out. We want you to create a short five minute piece of audio where you talk about what you love. Whether that's a business you've started or a hobby you've got, just let us know what it is that you love about it and why. Once you've exported your audio, you can upload that to SoundCloud and then send us a link to connect at creativerebels.co for us to have a listen. Winners will be selected two weeks from the day this goes live, so it's time to get recording. If you don't have Audition yet, you can go to creativerebels.co forward slash adobe to get a free trial. And remember, always be creating. See ya!